in the podcast. But we begin with an example of hard-won workers' rights in Britain. And if that phrase conjures up an image of beefy miners or dockers confronting their bosses, you might be in for a bit of a surprise. Because we're going back to 1976, when a group of South Asian women led a strike over poor working conditions. These were strikers in saris. They took the lead, but eventually more than 20,000 people joined the protest, which lasted for two years. Fahana Haider has been speaking to Lakshmi Patel, who was an employee at the Grunwick Film Processing Factory and took part in the strike. The Grunwick Film Processing Factory in North London employed mainly women of South Asian origin, most of whom were migrants from East Africa. They were commonly thought of as hardworking and passive. The women at the Grunwick factory would challenge this stereotype when they walked out over what they claimed was unfair treatment. They also wanted to join a union. I said I'm going to support our Asian women. I will stay outside on the picket line until conditions improve and we get union recognition. Conditions will improve at Grunwick once we are allowed to join the union. Grunwick will be better. Lakshmi Patel started working at the Grunwick factory in 1972 and had seen many of her colleagues treated poorly. In Grunwick, there was a big glass room. The manager used to sit in that room. He would observe us from that room. He would keep an eye on us. If we were going to the toilet, if it took too long, then he would ask why. What were you up to? If you didn't want to do overtime, you were forced to. There was a lot of Indian women working at Grunwick. Many of them were very scared. They were afraid of the supervisors and couldn't do anything about it. But one woman, Jayabin Desai, had had enough. In August 1976, she walked out in support of a sacked colleague. Here she is talking to the BBC about that day. I told that, look, this is not the situation for me to work. Give me my card straight away. And I walk out. So Mrs Desai walked out. And by Monday, the 23rd of August, five others, including her son, had joined her. They picketed the gates and they tried to persuade other workers to leave the factory and attend a meeting to draw up a list of grievances. I was on the picket line from the first day. Jayabin Desai felt strongly we needed to have a union in the factory. So we decided that all of us would come out at 3 o'clock that day. Jebin wanted it because of the poor working conditions and being forced to do overtime. Just four foot ten inches tall, not only did Jayabin lead the walkout, she was determined they would stay out for as long as it took. How long will you stay here? Unless when we will finish this dispute. A year? Any time. Five years? Ten years. You'd stay? We will stay. Jaya Masi Desai was a very strong woman. And she... she believed that women have so many rights in this country. Then why can't we have them too? She used to live just behind my house. We used to make the banners for the protests in my back garden. And she was not scared of nobody. The workers joined a trade union and began to make demands for better wages, a better working environment and better treatment. The Gronwick factory management refused to recognise their union membership. After months of picketing outside the factory, the women did, however, gain support from other trade unions, who began to advise them. Here's trade unionist Jack Dromey. What we then did was to organise together with the strikers for delegations of strikers to go to 2,000 workplaces throughout Britain in a 35-week period. What you saw was the remarkable spectre of, in J. Arvind Desai's words, little Asian ladies with dots on their head going into steel mills, car factories, engineering factories, aircraft factories. The visits from Jayabin and her colleagues worked, and what started out as a small industrial dispute grew day by day. And by June and July 1977, up to 20,000 people were taking part in protests outside the factory gates. Unions from across England supported us. 
The coal miners, post office workers, mostly all the unions supported us. How did that make you feel? We were so happy. We were so happy and proud that the whole of England was there to support us. With tensions mounting, there were often clashes between the trade unionists and the police as Grunwick's management began bussing in workers. The struggle on the streets of North London started to feature nightly on the TV news. Violence began with the arrival of the first busload of Grunwick workers. Instead of stopping as usual, the bus drove straight in, scattering pickets, MPs and police. Midnight, and Grunwick's looks more like a camp under siege than a film processing plant. Thousands of policemen, one-sixth of the Metropolitan Force, were brought in, and they had a tough time from the start. But the original Grunwick strikers did not take part in the skirmishes and violence. On one occasion, when a policeman was injured, the women, led by Jerbin, visited him in hospital with a cake to apologise. They were determined to continue with their demand for union recognition and improved conditions despite the fact they'd been on the picket line for months. Lakshmi was pregnant and had a baby boy during the dispute. In an effort to defuse the situation, an inquiry was set up by the government. I had made up my mind I would stay with Jebin. We were not scared. There were a lot of policemen, you could see them all over the street. All street police and only Jayamasi Desai was in the middle. There is no doubt I can say that there's a victory is nearer. But the Grunwick management refused to compromise or take part in mediation. Two years after the strike began, despite mass support, the trade unions felt that the dispute could not be won and decided to withdraw their backing. In July 1978, the strike was called off. All those women who remained on the picket line were fired, including Lakshmi Patel. But she doesn't believe the dispute was a complete failure. I was very proud of myself that it very I was so proud of myself that we fought for our rights, that the unions joined the picket line to help us. They could see that we had guts to do something for ourselves and our women. We felt that Asian women in England fought for two years for their rights. It didn't work out, but we were still proud of that fact. All the women felt that we are something because we put up such a fight for union recognition. We didn't give up. I'm so proud that we fought for our rights. Jaibin Desai also felt that the protests had not failed and some concessions had been won, as she explained in a BBC interview. The reason what we were fighting, we have achieved. The treatment with the staff has already changed. The wages was increased. Don't you think is a victory? In my opinion, victory. Although the reinstatement of the staff and union recognition, of both the issue was lost. Every victory, you can't get 100% victory, can you? Jaibin Desai died in 2010. The Grunwick dispute is seen by many as a pivotal moment for South Asian women workers in Britain. It raised their profile and challenged stereotypes. Lakshmi Patel found another job soon after being fired. She is now retired and still lives in London. In 2017, a mural was unveiled at the site of the dispute to honour the women who fought so hard for their rights. That was Fahana Haider reporting. Well, as Fahana mentioned, that strike in the 1970s has been seen as something of a turning point in British industrial relations. And I'm joined now by Dr Sundari Anita from the University of Lincoln, who has studied the Grunwick strike in great detail. So um, in sort of general terms, in terms of, of the sweep of British industrial relations, how would you see the importance of Grunwick? What was really important about Grunwick was not that South Asian women stood up in defence of their rights as workers, because they'd done that several times before. What was important was that this was the very first time white working class in Britain recognised their or saw common cause with uh, migrant women workers. Prior to Grunwick, there were several strikes um, where uh, women workers and South Asian women workers protested against unequal pay, but they found that they had to uh, challenge not just their employers, but also their trade unions who wouldn't stand with them. And so this was seen as a new era in trade union recognition of minority and migrant women workers' rights. It's an interesting one, though, isn't it? Because during the protest, it wasn't as if the South Asian women uh, strikers exactly saw eye to eye with the way the unions then wanted to adopt their case. The tactics did vary. 
Definitely. And that's why the strike ended in a failure, really. What we know now from looking at the documents that were released since then is that a lot of the pressure to end the support of the strike for trade unions came from the Labour government of the day. It had a, a wafer-thin majority and they uh, saw Grunwick as this public order issue and therefore they put pressure on the trade unions to withdraw their support. So um, there is a contradiction there in that the common members of the trade union Ordinary workers turned out in their thousands to support the Grunwick strikers, but the union bureaucracy initially supported them, but gradually turned away from that. And that's why the strike was lost. But it was very high profile. And, and what did it do more generally across the country for the standing of the South Asian community and in, in particular South Asian women? I think it challenged stereotypes of South Asian women. And in many ways, those stereotypes um, still hold. And we have to go back to Grunwick and look at what happened in that dispute to continuously challenge this construction of South Asian women as passive, as docile, as confined to the domestic sphere. And we really need to reclaim that account of their lives as workers and as workers who challenged exploitation at work. And one rights, not just for themselves, but for all of us British workers. And this exoticization, this con- surprise at their presence on the picket line, and I must say the BBC is part of that of uh, strikers and saris, this surprise that um, how come women are doing something that we see as unexpected. But to be fair, it was very unusual at the time. The, 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 the tag strikers in saris was not unjustified. It wasn't unusual. Like I said, there were several other disputes where South Asian women had been on strike before. It's just that they didn't win the support of trade unions and fellow workers. So what was unusual wasn't that they were striking. What was unusual was that finally they were being listened to by the broader trade union movement. And because the stereotype lingers to this day, does that mean that the South Asian community in Britain is not particularly aware of its own history when it comes to industrial relations and particularly to the Grunwick dispute? I definitely think that's the case. I remember interviewing one of the Grunwick strikers and on the morning of the interview, she was very excited. She said, my grandson's really excited that it's the day of my interview. And I told him everything about the Grunwick dispute. And uh, she said her grandson turned to her and said, you grandma, I can't believe you went on strike. And six months later, she called me to tell me that her grandson did a school project on Grunwick. And that's when we thought that this history is not even being celebrated by the very people who are at the center of it. And so we felt there's really a need to take the story out further. And uh, academic journal articles, books are not enough. And so we created a website with resources for schools and a comic. Clearly, there is a need to celebrate and reclaim these histories, not just for minority communities, but for majority communities as well, because this is part of our workers' history. And you can find the resources at uh, www.striking-women.org. Dr. Sundari Anitha from the University